I'd say the main messages for people is don't give up hope. That's the most important thing. So is hang that, on. Hang on, it's coming. Rick Doblin and the MAPS organization is virtually single-handedly responsible for bringing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as a healing modality for veterans, first responders, and anybody suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. The findings of his clinical trials are astonishing. This is a true revolution in medicine, and Rick Doblin is one of the unsung heroes of humanity. It was a pleasure to drop in with him on this podcast, get a full update on how everything is going with what I believe is the single thing that is going to change the world the most over the next five years. I can't wait to share this episode with Rick Doblin. The truth is, is that we're all the master, we're all the healer, we're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus. We're in this kind of like this zeitgeist and timeline of our culture where we're in this almost like just photo opportunity mindset. Like as long as you can see it and take a photo, that's what matters. <laughs> that's what was real, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, were, were you really there? Did you really feel it? You know, that's the, that's the interesting thing. I yeah. mean, it would be, if you could take MDMA for three minutes, yeah, that would be cool. But like not nearly the same as a five hour journey, right? You're not going to work through the material. You're just going to be like, whoa, what yeah. the, what, this is wild. And then yeah. you're done, you know, it's yeah. just. And, th and that's why we actually add a supplemental dose to turn it into an eight hour journey instead of a five hour journey. Right. So. Which is also why I think a boga is so effective. It's so long. Yeah. It like it has you for it has you for a day 24 hours yeah, up to you yeah. know so it's just patient and like you're in it you're sitting with it and you can wrestle around and and try and negotiate with the aboga but you're there <laughs> you're not going anywhere <laughs> you know i think yeah. that's important yeah and then there's another aspect of it too which is this idea of neuroplasticity mm -hmm. so that these uh, psychedelics do um, stimulate nerve terminal growth and new connections. And so there's something to be said for the length of time you're in the space because there is this brain change, physical brain change going on. Yeah. And that can account for long-term changes too. You've made new pathways, new routes. Yeah, I mean, uh, these this neuroplasticity, I, I imagine it like you know, you're carving a f new fresh set of tracks down fresh powder, right? Yes. And you can bomb the run one time, <laughs> you know, and you'll make a little mark in the snow. But really, the grooves that we have in our brain are like from skiing for a lifetime down the yeah, same path. Yeah. The moguls are huge. Yeah. And so it's really easy to fall into these pathways. So if you can get eight hours to ski the same track of love, let's say, like a new way to love the world or a new idea about yourself, the more time you have to spend on those skis down that track, the deeper it's going to go, like the more lasting the experience is going to be for you. Yeah. And one of the things that sort of reinforces that idea is that we had um, a fellow in our study who had PTSD from Vietnam. Mm. So almost half a century of these PTSD tracks, and he was still able to get better, that you can have hope that you can be in these deep grooves of half a century almost of PTSD patterns mm. and you can get out of that still. They're How was that for him? Because he probably gave up hope a long time ago. I, I think he had. And I think that there was a lot, so a lot of the people that are volunteering for our studies um, really don't even want to give themselves permission to believe that it'll work, you know, because they've been through, through so much stuff that hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. So they come in in kind of a pessimistic way. Others have come in and said, this is my last chance. If it doesn't work, I'm going to kill myself. Mm -hmm. um, but what it's like for them to see that change is possible is amazing. Yeah. How, I mean, how stunning it must be for the facilitators to go through these experiences because yeah. like deeply at the call to be a, psychologist or psychiatrist or counselor or anything like that is this call to service like you you yeah. want to you want to help people and you really want to see that you're making a difference in people's lives and now with this tool that's coming online 
like it must be overwhelmingly powerful for the for the therapist. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that, that many of the therapists say though is that it's very, very hard for them to go back to their patients outside of the protocol yeah. and not have this tool of MDMA to help them do the therapy. Now <laughs> sure. they've got to struggle through people that get blocked, the fear is too great, they can't make progress and so we're building a lot of dissatisfied therapists <laughs> who are having trouble going back to their normal yeah. approaches because we can only do this as part of a protocol. It's, like, it's yeah. very limited. It's like you have you get used to a perfectly honed, handcrafted machete, and you're charting <laughs> your way through the jungle, and they're like, okay, back to the butter knife. You're like, come on, <laughs> come on, butter knife, really? Yeah. Yeah, I could see how that could be, uh, how that could be difficult. Yeah. But the, the good news is that you know ultimately and it's not for everybody and not all applications but i mean we are speeding to the reality in which this is going to be a viable tool and for the right situation from the right and the for the right people to serve it's we're so where are we at in this process like what's the latest up to the minute update of (laughs) where we are in this legalization quest that's been going going on since the 80s and here we are in 2021 yeah and damn we're close now (laughs) Well, I was just reflecting when you you talk about speeding, that is kind of when you look at it now, there's rapid progress, but my sense of it is that we're crawling (laughs) and we're finally to this place where it's speeding up a bit. But where we are at this exact moment is that in order to make a drug into a medicine, according to uh, regulatory agencies, particularly the FDA, and we're also doing research right now in Israel, Canada, and the FDA. So our phase three studies for MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD are in three different countries. We're starting work in Europe in um, nine sites in six countries, including England. We've got projects in Australia, Brazil. We're trying to build stuff, uh, projects in South Africa, Somaliland, Rwanda, Bosnia, Armenia, a lot of, one day we hope to be working inside refugee camps. But where we are now is that on the May 10th, we published our results from our first phase three study. And the results were phenomenal, better than we could have even hoped. Better than the phase two? or Better than the phase two. Wow. So what were the, what were, if you were going to summarize the results, because I've talked about the phase two a bit, but I haven't talked about the phase three results. Okay. Well, in phase two, um, what we were doing is uh, you know, refining our method, figuring out if we could do a double-blind study, what are the doses, who do we include, who do we exclude. So when we combine all that in phase two, what we showed is that the control group, and um, I, I, I'm reluctant a little bit to call it a placebo group since in our case it's therapy. So it's not just an inactive sure. placebo pill, but people get 42 hours of therapy with in the control group, either no MDMA or low dose MDMA. And so we lump that together versus the people that get uh, therapy with full dose MDMA. And what we showed there is that uh, 23% of the people that were severe, chronic, treatment resistant PTSD, um, an average of um, around 15 years of PTSD, that 23% no longer had PTSD at the two month follow up. So that's therapy without MDMA or therapy with low dose MDMA. And then what we showed is at the uh, group that got MDMA, it was 56% no longer had PTSD. And of those that had uh, PTSD, most of them, uh, of those that still had PTSD, most of them had what's called clinically significant reductions of PTSD symptoms. Mm -hmm. So their lives were changed, their PTSD symptoms were reduced, but they still had PTSD. And if we could have given them a fourth session or so, Sure. Um, but what we did do is we waited and we didn't do anything more. And at the one year follow up, what we showed is that two thirds no longer had PTSD. So, what that is phenomenal because what it showed is that people still keep getting better on their own afterwards. And that 12 month follow up is going to be the key to insurance companies because the two month follow up is the key to whether FDA will approve it or not. We have mm-hmm. to show statistically significant differences between the two groups and then FDA will approve it. But since it's labor intensive, the question is, will insurance companies cover it? So to show that it's durable and people keep getting better is phenomenal. That gives us hope that that this will be both introduced and adopted and we can really scale it. Mm-hmm. Now, so in phase three, what, what? well, the last thing, what we learned in phase two 
is that the low doses of MDMA um, that we thought would be able to produce a double blind, that that would be the way we would do double blind studies. We would have therapy with low dose MDMA, therapy with full dose MDMA. And the challenge would be to find the dose of MDMA that was high enough to cause some confusion, but not so high that it had so much therapeutic potential that you could never tell a difference between the two groups. Sure. And that was what my um, dissertation at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and was, you, and was about. And when you say confusion, you mean confusion for the administer well, of the medicine so that they, so it still remains blind. Well, confusion for, there, there's what's called triple blind. So we, we normally think of double blind, but triple blind means confusion for the patient, confusion for the uh-huh. researchers, therapists, and confusion for the people that do the outcome measures. Right. So we're able to get the outcome measures done in a in a blinded way because they that do it all, all by telemedicine. They we tell the patient, don't say, you know, whether you think you got MDMA. It's just an hour-long interview about their symptoms. So what we showed, unfortunately, uh, in a way for me, is that my dissertation was wrong and that I did not find the solution to the double blind problem. And that while the low doses, 25 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 40 milligrams, um, they did um, confuse some people as to whether they got low dose or full dose. And they confused um, the therapist sometimes, maybe 20% of the time there was confusion, but that's meaning they guessed wrong. Mm -hmm. But what we showed, which we did not expect, is that the low doses actually made people uncomfortable and that it compromised the therapy. Mm -hmm. So that the people that had the therapy without any MDMA did a little bit better than the people that got the therapy with low dose MDMA. And so the best way to describe it is uh, an airplane, you're taking off and there's turbulence at the beginning and then you can get over the clouds and then it's smooth sailing. But MDMA is, particularly for people who are heavily traumatized, who are struggling, have not been able to get over their trauma and the memories are overwhelming, for them to have this these eight hour sessions, three eight hour sessions, one month apart and 12 90 minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions. So them to be in an eight hour session to confront their trauma when they haven't been able to do it before. And the MDMA gives them a little bit of um, focus, but it doesn't. it's not enough to reduce the fear, to quiet sure. the amygdala. So what we discovered there was that the um, low dose did not really work. It had an anti-therapeutic effect in a way, mm-hmm. but, but again, people still got better. So for phase three, what we um, went to the FDA and also to the European Medicines Agency, and we said there is no solution to the double blind problem, um, at least for MDMA for PTSD. Uh, uh, this doesn't necessarily apply to psilocybin or LSD, but for MDMA for PTSD, there's no good solution for the double blind problem. And so we said to the FDA that we can give you a certain amount of confusion, a certain amount of blinding, but you're going to make it easier. If we do that, it'll be easier to see a difference between the two groups because the therapy will be compromised a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the real question is, if you can do this healing work with therapy without a drug, why bother add the drug? Right. So what we really want to do is compare therapy at its best, which is without MDMA, with therapy with MDMA. And so the FDA agreed to that. And um, it, it is a big issue. And they brought this fellow named Bob Temple, who's like the old wise man at the FDA. Mm-hmm. He's been at the FDA since 1972. <laughs> uh, he's, uh, and actually 1972 is when I decided to focus my life on psychedelics when I was 18. So he was already at the FDA. And he's the Office of Science Policy. He's the expert in scientific methodology. And so they brought him into the final meeting that we had in what's called the special protocol assessment process where we negotiate the design of the phase three study. And he came and he said, there is um, a lot of sense in what they're saying to do MDMA with therapy versus uh, inactive placebo with therapy. Mm -hmm. And so that's the design for phase three. And we had to do two 100 person phase three studies. And because of COVID, we had trouble um, once we hit COVID and the lockdown, enrolling more people, we couldn't do that. So we came to agreement with FDA that we would end the first phase three study at 90 patients. And so what we found was that the people that got placebo with therapy, 32% no longer had PTSD. So it's a little bit better than the 23%. 
And you can see how the argument that we made to the FDA that now, because the placebo group is doing better, it is harder to find a difference now yeah, because sure. they're doing better, but that's the real test and that's what we wanted to do. But what we showed is that in the group that got MDMA and the way we designed it, the first session was 80 milligrams, followed two hours later by 40 milligrams, mm -hmm. which extends it to about an eight hour session. Mm -hmm. The second session is a negotiation. It's either, it could be the 80 followed by 40 or it could be up to 120 milligrams followed by 60 and about 90, 95% go up to the 120 followed by 60. And then the third session is also um, a negotiation, but again, it's almost always the fuller dose. Mm -hmm. But we start with a little bit lower dose. It gets people adjusted. They make a lot of progress still. All right, so what we showed is in the group that got therapy with MDMA, 67% um, no longer had PTSD. After the two month mark? After the two month one. Wow. So it's, we were only at 56% before in phase two, and now we're at 67% in phase three. And we don't have the 12 month data yet because it's recent. Sure, what I'm telling but you, we about. Could, you could make the logical conclusion that it's just gonna increase from there. Yeah, that's what we think and that's what we hope. And now the, the other things to say about this though, and this is where um, we get into a little bit of um, stigma of psychedelics and how the FDA regulates things, but um, statistical significance is the key. So this measure that I just told you is loss of diagnosis of PTSD. That's not how the FDA is gonna decide whether to approve the drug. They decide on the basis of statistical significance. Mm -hmm. And what that means is um, that there's um, a one in 20 chance that whatever the finding that you have is due to some random factor rather than to your intervention. And that's called 0.05. So yep. basically nickel out of a dollar, 0.05. Um, and if you are at that level or below, then you have statistical significance. Um, two of those studies are generally required to make a drug into a medicine. So 0 0.05 times 0 0.05, assuming that they're independent studies, that's basically one in 400. So you have a one in 400 um, chance it's due to random factors and then you'll get the drug approved. If it's at 0 0.05, which is the threshold. Yeah, or, or, or less. All right, so the FDA has another measure that they call robust, very persuasive, and that's 0 0.001, means one in a thousand chance mm -hmm. that it's um, due to some random factor. And under certain circumstances, if you get 0 0.001, one in a thousand chance, they will approve the drug on the basis of only one phase three study instead of two. So we were hoping, yeah, okay, maybe we can get close to 0 0.001. Um, what it turned out we got was 0 0.0001. Woo-wee, we, we, one in 10,000. One in 10,000. <laughs> it was utterly shocking. And so that also means that um, there's not a lot of variability. Yep. So that's a factor in statistics. So what it means is most everybody that got the uh, therapy plus MDMA did well, mm -hmm. and that there wasn't a whole big range of, of variability. So the other part that you look at, and this is again more for um, insurance companies, is it worth it, is called effect size. And so an effect size measure is designed to um, equalize studies, uh, treatments across studies. Because you can have statistical significance um, which is independent of your effect size. And the more subjects you have in a study, the more numbers you have, the easier it is to find statistical significance from smaller and smaller effects. Sure. So that's why you hear studies with thousands and thousands of people and they'll find statistical significance from some minor effect that may not even be that clinically significant. Sure. So the SSRIs that were approved for PTSD, Zoloft and Paxil, have, um, very small effect sizes or on the low end of medium. And that's the effect size of one is considered very large and that's one standard deviation from the norm. So if you have moved people from you know the bell curve, if they're off one standard deviation from the norm, that's a very large effect. And that's um, 0.8 is considered a large effect size. So even 0.8 of uh, standard deviation. And as I said, the Zoloft and Paxil were 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, and one was 0.56. So 0.5 is where it starts to be medium, 0.8 is large. And so 
there's two ways to figure out effect sizes. Um, the normal way is called placebo subtracted. So you look at your control group, you look at your treatment group, you kind of um, do some math that in essence subtracts the effect of the control group. And so that's called placebo subtracted. And we had 0.91, which is large. It was mm -hmm. terrific, better than anything approved. But what it really means is that we've taken the therapy group that got inactive placebo and we've subtracted their benefits from the therapy with MDMA and we're left with just the effect of MDMA. Mm -hmm. But in actual practice, it's gonna be MDMA plus therapy. Yep. That's our main story. It's, it's really the therapy that the MDMA makes more effective. So when you look just at the group that got the MDMA plus therapy, we had a 2.1 effect size. Two standard deviations from the norm, enormous. Now, the other part of this is um, dissociative subtype, which is considered the hardest group to treat. Mm -hmm. And we, we feel like because of the stigma of psychedelics, we have to work with the hardest cases. So we also let people into our studies that have previously attempted suicide. Which no one would do for any other yeah, study on it, a drug, it, like an antidepressant or anything it, like it, that. It's very rare that, that people, sometimes they'll do it, but uh, very rare. And in PTSD, it's it's pretty rare. So we feel like we, we, we work with the hardest cases. And what dissociative subtype means is that when you're traumatized, you're physically hurt, you're, you know, one of the classic strategies is to sort of pretend you're not there, is that you're not really there. You escape in your mind. Your body's in an incredible pain, but you escape in your mind. And the problem with that is that it does help you get by the traumatic incident, but then it gets harder for you to get back engaged with the trauma because when it happened, your imprint is, I can't handle it, I'm running away, I'm, I'm going away in my mind. And so the traumatic incident, you, you have to reconnect it. And every time you try to reconnect, you get the painful memories, the fear, the anxieties. Right. And so it reinforces itself. And so people get more and more dissociated over time sometimes as a result of trauma. So tra the dissociative subtype is considered the hardest group to treat. And what we showed, again, to our surprise, is that they did better than the average of the other people that something about MDMA is integrative. It helps people pull together their dissociated memories and it helps people remember their traumas. It reduces activity in the amygdala and you have a you don't have the normal fear response. So what we showed was that it works in the hardest cases. Now, all of this would be um, important, but it's just about efficacy. So I have to talk now about safety. Mm -hmm. Because if you have great results, but half the people die because it's not safe or whatever, you're not gonna make something into a medicine. We'll, we'll have to deal with this with Ibogaine to demonstrate that it can be given safely, which I think it can be uh -huh. with a, under medical supervision without anybody ever dying. That, that's a different story. But uh -huh. again, safety is important. So we, we had one person in our study um, tried to kill herself twice during the study. Um, fortunately, did not succeed. We had another woman who had such severe suicidal ideation coming from this confrontation with her trauma that she had suppressed that in order to avoid self-harm, she checked herself into an inpatient facility as a self-protection. So all of these are considered serious adverse events. Um, what we are happy to report, I guess, is that both of these people were in the placebo control group. We didn't have anybody in oh, the MDMA wow. group try to hurt themselves. Wow. And so what we showed also is that in cases of severe suicidal, serious suicidal ideation, we had more, five of those cases in the placebo group and only three of those cases in the MDMA group. So the safety record is excellent. The other criteria that the FDA looks at, and, and just to elaborate now on safety, the, so there are acute side effects from MDMA. And we monitor all of those. And there's um, loving uh, your family, <laughs> enjoying life more, <laughs> things like those, that. Those are very, very helpful. <laughs> Maybe finding God in your own heart. <laughs> it's, it's very strange things. We shouldn't document these very rigorously <laughs> so people are aware that this might happen to you. You might change all your relationships, <laughs> end up happier. But yeah. but what they do have is teeth grinding, sweating, <laughs> yes, a little indeed. muscle tension. Yeah. 
And As it, the famous rapper once said, "Pop to Molly, I'm sweating." <laughs> 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 yeah, yep. and and it is more in the MDMA group than the placebo group, but yep. it's short lived. It's not very um, problematic, and it fades. So safety is good. Then the other thing that the FDA looks at is called um, the distribution of results. So we have fifteen sites: two in Israel, two in Canada, eleven throughout the United States. And what they want to see, ideally, is that there's no statistical difference between the results you get in the different sites. Meaning mm -hmm. that if you have a few sites that are performing great and then the rest of the sites don't do that well, maybe that's because the therapist at these few sites are so great that this thing is not gonna scale, that it's about the therapist skill. And Well, presumably because the same therapist for placebo and not, that would kind of equal out in, in that in, hypothesis. In, in, that, in their team, yes, yeah. in their sites, yes, they would get better results for their placebo. But if the other therapists aren't as good, then, then they won't get as good results on either. Yep. And so what we were able to demonstrate statistically is that there is no effect by site meaning that the teams at the different sites did equally, more or less equally well. And the, the really good part of that is that it's either we could say because of three factors. First off, um, who comes in? Who do we choose to, to let into the therapy program? Then it's our therapy training. Um, and then we think that the main factor really though is the MDMA, that that sort of equalizes, helps even therapists who aren't as skilled get really good results as the ones who are more skilled. So the fact that we had no effect by sight, we had a tremendous safety record. We had one in 10,000 um, statistical significance. We had very, very unusually large effect sizes. We applied to the FDA and we said that we want to go to a, a new drug approval with just one phase three study. We meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. The FDA said no that they would not let us do that and that they wanna see the second phase three study. And what they said was that we're convinced that you can demonstrate efficacy with fewer people than we wanna see for safety. And so it's contrasted by what we just saw about the Alzheimer's drug that the FDA approved with great criticism on the basis of studies that were mostly failed, but one marginally effective study. And they um, approved this drug. And now they've had to pull back and there is an internal investigation at the FDA, but they were willing to approve this Alzheimer's drug with very minimal benefits and significant side effects that are worrisome and fa several failed studies. So in our case, I think it's again, the stigma of psychedelics. Sure. And the FDA wants to see. So where we're at now is that um, we've enrolled about 35 people of the 100 in the second phase three study. And we anticipate that what's called the interim analysis. Um, so just to um, not get too detailed or scientific, but what it means is that the FDA is basically set up to help you succeed. Now it may not see that, seem that way, but they, they want you to succeed. And so you, at the very beginning, you look at what you think your effect size is and you design in the statistical power calculations how many people you're gonna to need to see a difference to have a certain percentage of likelihood of success. So what we've done is we've set the bar high that we wanna make sure we have a 90% chance of success and we set the effect size at 0.56. So we, we assumed a lower effect size. So at a 0.56 effect size, to be 90% sure of succeeding and getting statistical significance, um, we come up with the 100 subjects mm -hmm. in each study. And what the FDA permits you to do is when the study is, you can debate where this goes, but for us, it's when the study is 60% done. When we have 60% of the subjects have reached their, their two-month follow-up and the rest have been enrolled. So when we have all 100 enrolled, 60%, we have their final data point at the two-month. Um, then you have an independent committee that, looks at the results and they'll tell me, the sponsor, um, a number. All they tell me is a number and the number is either zero, meaning you don't need to add anybody to get statistical significance or you need to add X number of people or there's no number of people you can add, it fails for futility. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that the more subjects you add, the more you are able to find smaller and smaller effects. Sure. So if our effect size was less than five, six, and we were in danger of not getting, uh, no longer had 90% chance of success, then we could add subjects. 
So in our first phase three study, we were told zero. We didn't have to add anybody. Um, we think that's likely to happen in the second one. Um, there's only two drugs that have been declared breakthrough therapy for PTSD by the FDA. Um, the interim analysis that's, that we had on our first phase three study was um, in March of uh, 2020, and that's when we were told zero. But this other company, uh, Tonics Pharmaceuticals, had a drug called Tonmaya, which was a repurposed sleeping pill. They thought they could help people not have nightmares. Mm -hmm. they, did, they were breakthrough therapy for PTSD on the basis of early preliminary data. They did their interim analysis, and they were told, give up the study. It fails for futility. You're never going to find a difference. It didn't work. So they'd spent um, well over $100 million on this study and it completely mm -hmm. failed. So the next big point for us is going to be the end of March, early April 2020, and that's when we get the interim analysis. Twenty, oh, Excuse me, yeah, 2022. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when we get the interim analysis for this study. And we think that we will complete the study in October of 2022. It'll take us a month or two to analyze the data, and then we submit that to the FDA. And then it'll take them... Um, Around uh, six months or so to analyze the data, so that we and that and you and you were given breakthrough status, right? We were given breakthrough, yeah. and that's going to mean that everything is expedited on the processing side. Isn't yeah. that one of the benefits of getting breakthrough status? Yes, one of the benefits of that is that uh, yeah, normally there's like an eight month or longer review time. We'll have a six month review time, but the other benefit is more meetings with the FDA. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're meeting with them right now. Is called the is about the REMS, and that means risk evaluation and mitigation strategies. So the FDA has these policy tools that they can customize the requirements post approval for the specific risks of the drug. And this was developed initially for thalidomide, which is the drug that people may remember as uh, being given to women for morning sickness and causing terrible birth defects, where people would be mm. born without limbs, and this was approved in Europe for morning sickness. And there was a, um, in the early 60s, the FDA, this woman, Frances Kelsey, blocked thalidomide from coming into the US. She was concerned by the safety signals. And in the end, she was the only person at the FDA ever to win a Presidential Medal of Honor oh, wow. because of her blocking thalidomide and saving thousands and thousands of women and, and fathers from having these deformed babies. Um, Years later, we discovered that the blood constricting effects of thalidomide are helpful in treating certain tumors and leprosy. So thalidomide, the, the epitome of a bad, dangerous drug, is now an FDA approved drug. So it proves that there's no good drug or bad drug. There's no such thing as a good drug sure. or a bad drug. It's how you use it. And so the FDA developed a set of procedures for thalidomide, which is that their phys the pharmacist has to be educated, the patients have to get this educated. They wanna make sure no pregnant woman ever gets this drug. And there's a patient registry. So everybody that ever gets thalidomide is tracked to make sure there's no inadvertent birth defects, however. So that was how these REMS began. And now there's negotiations. What we're saying to the FDA and also to the DEA, because they're concerned because it's a scheduled drug about diversion. What we're saying that the real thing going on here is therapy that the drug makes the therapy more effective. So therefore the treatment is MDMA-assisted therapy. And once it's approved as a medicine, we want the only people that can treat patients to be therapists that have been through our training program to learn how to do the therapy. Mm -hmm. They don't have to actually do the therapy as they were taught post-approval. They can innovate. We're not trying to control what they do later. And the FDA doesn't control the practice of medicine so that once the drug is approved, therapists, physicians, they can prescribe what's called off-label, mm -hmm. meaning it's not exactly what it was approved for. But we want the uh, therapist to be trained. We also want a special training for the prescribers. So we're gonna have like a two to four hour training for the prescribers or doctors, mostly just about the physical effects. And the training of the therapist is gonna be um, about 100 hours of mostly um, thinking about our method, learning about that, uh, watching videotapes of therapy sessions, um, doing role plays, and, and all this supervised by our training team. So we, we have one training program right now that's when we've gone virtual, we've got 310 people in it. 
We're going to start another one in September. So for anybody that's listening, that's a therapist that might be interested in how many spots you got, because I well, think there's going to be a lot of people who are listening to this that are going to be interested. Yeah. Well, we're going to try to do 500. We've right. got about uh, 300 or so already chosen. It's going to start in September. Ryan, we got to get this podcast out sooner. <laughs> Otherwise, our people are not going to get any spots <laughs> in the therapy sessions. Yeah. And, and we will keep doing this. Okay. I, I mean, so there'll be trainings on and on. Um, so what we're saying to the FDA, though, is that the REM should include this. It should also include something else, which is that the only administration is under direct supervision of the therapists, meaning it's never going to be a take-home drug. We're not going to say, so even if the therapists are trained, they're not going to be able to say, here, uh, take this home. We have gone to um, sort of telemedicine, you could say, for a lot of the preparation and integration sessions. Mm-hmm. But for the actual dosing with MDMA, we, we think that should be in person. No doubt. And we believe in a two-person therapy team. Um, again, we're trying to maximize therapeutic outcomes. There's gonna be pressure over time, particularly from the insurance companies, to go to a one therapist model. But we feel there's a couple reasons why the two therapist model is better. And the way we wanna handle the economics of it is that the first person is licensed to do therapy and the second person is more like an apprentice. Mm-hmm. and that they're getting their hours to do therapy, uh, to be a therapist, or they don't necessarily ever want to be a therapist. Maybe they could just be a massage therapist. You could combine right. MDMA with massage or, or different ways to do things. So, um, But it will initially probably, these REMs will require two therapists in the room. We don't know. That's a negotiation. Um, and what we're also saying is that there's certain safety concerns, particularly blood pressure, that uh, MDMA can increase your blood pressure a little bit. We want people's heart checked out. So there'll be a certain number of things that are required to be checked out by the prescriber. And then whether or not there'll be a patient registry is unclear yet, but there is a patient registry for GHB, which is a medicine for narcolepsy. There's a patient registry for ketamine, which is now for depression. Um, we're arguing against it because it's more expensive. There's really no need for it, but we think there's a good chance we'll be required to have a patient registry. Um, the other part of it is that there's going to be specialty pharmacies where the drug is not something that the patient picks up at the pharmacy. The drug is sent to the prescriber Mm -hmm. and the patient only gets the drug when they're in the psychedelic clinic and handed a bowl, um, or a goblet or whatever. So we, we don't put the pill in the person's hand because from the very beginning, our, our, our method is about people healing themselves. We want to empower people to heal themselves. So we want them to do that initial reaching out to get the pill so that they are choosing to do it. It's their choice that we present it to them. We present this option. We'll have spent all these now 35 years and it'll be more and all these, we've, raised $115 million in donations so far to get this this point. But, you know, we've done a lot to present this option to people, but we want them to choose it. And that's a big part of the healing. So this is what I think was going to be the REMS. And so what we think now is by the second half of 1993, we've got a good chance of having approval. In 2023. 2023. In FDA, Israel, and Canada. We're Mm -hmm. negotiating right now with... um, the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Authority in Australia, they might go earlier. One of the benefits for us of Brexit is that the English uh, equivalent of the FDA called the MHRA, they wanna demonstrate that they they got something out of Brexit. And what they wanna demonstrate is that they can go faster than Europe. Mm. And, And England did go faster on the vaccines. And so now they're trying to make it that on heart drugs, cancer drugs, and mental health, they may be having this ability to go even faster. So we think we might get approval um, in England before the rest of Europe. But Europe, we're thinking, is going to be uh, the end of 2024 right now. And um, in Australia, it may be uh, that they'll approve um, compassionate use, which um, there's different ways you can do that where it's either on a named patient basis or they just say, here's the protocol, anybody can volunteer as soon as they meet these criteria. So where we're at is um, poised uh, for a likely approval. I'd say the biggest concern that we have that would um, maybe knock us off track is several people in the MDMA group committing suicide. 
because that would increase the risk of profile of this going forward. We don't think that's going to happen. As I said, nobody's ever in phase two. Nobody in the MDMA group tried to hurt themselves. In phase three, nobody tried to hurt themselves. But I'd say that's our biggest vulnerability. And so we're very careful about how we track people after the MDMA when they might have now suppressed this trauma for a long time. The MDMA brings it to the surface. We're helping them deal with it. Um, but we call them every other day for a week to check in with them. Every meeting that we have, they have to fill out this form called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. So it's like five or 10 minutes, but it's just where are they at with their uh, suicidal ideation, things like that. So we're tracking their emotional status very frequently, mm -hmm. particularly related to suicidality. So I think that that's the main concern that we have. We don't think that anybody's going to have a um, heart attack or anything like that. I mean, that's always possible. But the, And the other big thing that the FDA and the DEA are concerned about, which has not been a problem, is this idea that we've given people MDMA, a party drug, ecstasy. And now after the therapy, they're going to want to go get addicted to it and use it all the time. Hmm. That That's the concern. What is the abuse liability of this drug? We're exposing people to a drug that people think makes you happy, makes you parties. And so what we find is that more than a few of the subjects in our study say have said the same thing. They said, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. Yeah, sure. It's work. The, it's work. They're they're dealing with their trauma. They're, it's hard work, and and they have to go through a lot of pain and suffering. Sure. But it's it's like grief. You you know you're crying, but it's crying in a way that's healing and cleansing. Yeah, catharsis. They're they're finally letting it out. Catharsis is the great word for it. So we don't see people reporting um, using going after ecstasy or MDMA on their own afterwards. Now it only stays in the blood a few days, so there's really no way for us to like verify this by blood tests or anything. It's not like cannabis that stays in your sure. blood for a month or so. Um, so we, we take their word for it, but we don't see any evidence of this abuse liability. So all, overall, I think we've got a really good chance. We're the, of all the groups that are in phase three, um, well, of, of all the psychedelic, uh, n there's over a hundred now psychedelic companies, for-profit companies. Um, Interestingly enough, there's not a single big pharma company that's working on psychedelic psychotherapy. Johnson & Johnson did get the ketamine approved, but that was uh, ketamine without therapy, mm -hmm. which is suboptimal. But but of all these companies, we're the only one in phase three. And there's several one, like Atai, that just went public, $2.8 billion market cap, uh, MindMed, like 1.8 market cap, Compass, 1.8 billion market cap. So what you can say that we've done is in 35 years of work with 115 million so far of donations, we've created well in excess of a billion dollars of public value. So we have no investors. So what we have is two companies. One is the nonprofit MAPS, and that's what I started in 1986. And that's when I was assuming that because it's a generic, that it would be generic as soon as it was made into a medicine. Mm -hmm. That it was invented by Merck in 1912. They never tested it in humans. It's in the public domain. Um, I saw in the late 80s that, um, in, well, in 1986, when I started MAPS, another group called, uh, uh, with Howard Lotsoff and others, they just started a company called NDA International, and that was for Ibogaine. And that was to make Ibogaine into a medicine, and they did that in a for-profit way. And what happened is they worked with uh, Deborah Mash. They, they ran out of, um, money, she completed a study, she discovered a long lasting metabolite and uh, she thought that it was her right to uh, patent that. And then they said, oh, we helped you get this started. So anyway, they went into long lawsuits and this whole field of Ibogaine development was really um, tanked for, for decades by all these litigation. But I saw that happen. So I went to the um, lawyer, the patent lawyer for the Ibogaine people who got the use patent on I began for opiate addiction and other addictions. And I said, I want you guys to help me develop an anti-patent strategy so nobody could get use patents on MDMA for PTSD or anything. I didn't want to patent it. We, do, we didn't invent the idea. MDMA was used sure. for PTSD in the late 70s and early 80s. So it, it just feels wrong. You know, We didn't invent the idea. We didn't invent our therapeutic approach. It came from the early work with LSD, with Stan Groff. Um, 
with Leo Zeff, the secret chief, the underground, the leader of the underground psychedelic therapy movement. So um, I wanted to make sure nobody could patent the uses of it. So I just thought it would become generic and that would be fine because people would get it. But what I realized later on, years later, I'm amazed I um, didn't know this earlier. My, my dissertation at Harvard was about, at the Kennedy School of Government, was about the regulation of uh, Schedule One drugs by the FDA. I, I took a class at Harvard Law School by the leading food and drug lawyer. And um, through all of this, I missed something very obscure, which was that in 1984, Ronald Reagan had signed a law to provide incentives for developing drugs that are off patent. And those incentives um, are called data exclusivity. And so what that means is that um, it's not a patent, it, but no one can use our data immediately to market a generic for five years. And in Europe, it's mm. 10 years. Mm. And if you do studies in pediatric populations, meaning initially 12 to 17 year olds, which the FDA is requiring us to do. If we succeed with making MDMA into a medicine for adults 18 or older, we have to do kids 12 to 17 year olds who are traumatized. And the incentive there is first off, well, for us, the incentive is the closer you can treat people to the trauma, the better it sure. is, the more value it is for their lives, their families. But you get an extra six months data exclusivity for these pediatric population studies. And it doesn't even have to succeed in kids. You just have to try in kids. And if the study fails, you still get the six months data extension. But chances are, I think it'll work. And then that's five and a half years of data exclusivity. And the additional benefit you get is it blocks a generic competitor from submitting their application to the FDA until the five and a half years is over. So they can't have refined their process and submitted to FDA years before in anticipation and then five and a half years is over and then that day they can market the generic. So it takes FDA at least six months or so on average to review a, a new generic drug. So chances are we're gonna have um, six years of data exclusivity. In Europe, I said it's 10. Um, what the, the beauty of it from our public benefit perspective is that we're not blocking anybody from doing anything. If they wanna get their own data for MDMA for PTSD, they can. And what they're probably more likely to do, and we already know this, is that they're gonna to try to develop new MDMA-like drugs that they could get patents yeah, on. Yeah, different am analogs, go the saucer shulgin route and yeah, try and, and figure it out. Exactly, and then they'll patent something. So what, what we've got with this um, data exclusivity period is a new story to tell to donors. So. MDMA is good for PTSD, but MDMA is good for um, people who have life-threatening illnesses that are scared of dying. MDMA is great for social anxiety. We're doing studies now with eating disorders. There's been research in England by uh, Ben Sessa and his team in MDMA for alcohol use disorder. So for all of these, which the primary studies that you're doing through phase three is for treatment-resistant PTSD. Well, not for treatment-resistant. So for PTSD, PTSD, severe PTSD. The, the FDA told us that if in, almost everybody is treatment resistant in yeah. our study, but uh, and they've had PTSD an average of over 14 years, one third had PTSD over 20 years. But they said, if we make the study specifically requiring treatment yeah, yeah. resistant, they would only yeah, approve it, it for treatment resistant. Makes sense. Okay, so it's, yeah. it's yeah. approved for PTSD. Yeah. All people who prescribe it, even off-label for these other, because it's still gonna be off-label because yeah. you haven't gone through the full approval process, but they'll still go through your training yes. to be yes. able to prescribe it. But once yeah. you go through the training, yeah. then there's data that's available yeah. to yeah. show that it treats all of these other different conditions well. As well, there's, there, not really. So there's early preliminary phase Indi two indications, data. Right. Yeah, indications, Early promising data. And so for a long time, the FDA, wanted and succeeded in preventing pharmaceutical companies from sharing with their prescribers data from small phase two studies. You were prohibited from doing that because they thought that would be a way for pharmaceutical companies to increase sales but not do the full research to see if it's really necessary. But then the pharmaceutical industries and their lawyers sued under uh, First Amendment rights that they have the right to share information that's in the public domain and the FDA lost. So where this line is, is that we can do these small phase two studies. We can say it looks useful in all these different areas, um, but we cannot knowingly sell or promote off-label uses. We sure. can share information. Just open source, open source yeah. the data from all of these, all this research that you're doing. Yeah, and then the question that the prescribers will have is, 
Can they get insurance coverage for something that we've not proved? Will insurance companies pay for sure. it? And medical malpractice. If something goes wrong and they're using it for something that's not been approved as the label. Which is the case for all off-label use. Yeah. You could get it, caught the medical board and you could lose, you know, yeah. whatever. And But the, the defense, actually, for malpractice um, came about, ironically, because of uh, chemotherapy. So that when chemotherapy came in, in the 50s and 60s, it was very dangerous to people. And it was, you know, they used higher doses than they use now of the, the chemotherapy agents. And and so there was a lot of people that were starting to experiment with chemotherapy and they were um, challenged by their uh, medical boards and others to say that they were um, doing um, harm. And so the legal definition now is to protect yourself against medical malpractices, you need a quote, significant minority of your peers. So it doesn't have to be the leading view, It does, but there has to be significant minority. It means it has to be people with reputations of some kind. Yeah, you're not a lone wolf. You're not alone, that, that's exactly. So we think that there will be a lot of this off-label no doubt, prescription. it's gonna work. And what that's we, my opinion. That's not that's yeah. not officially. I'm just saying it's yeah. gonna fucking work. Yeah, and I have to be more and more careful. But, I can but, hear you, and but, you are dancing <laughs> through raindrops like a like a ninja wizard, yeah. Rick. And I appreciate yeah. that. Well, well, here's the shocking thing for me is that we've had to hire somebody uh, whose job is called he's the compliance officer. Of course. So from a bunch of us, uh, you know psychedelic rebels, counterculture criminals, <laughs> you know, to have to have a compliance officer, just even the name of it is like, oh, it makes me cringe. But, yeah. you know, but anyway, we have to comply with what we can say to avoid yeah. getting in trouble with the FDA or getting in trouble with the DEA or state medical boards. Yeah. So I, I think that what we want to do though, is look at other indications that are promising and then make them also do the phase three studies so that they're fully approved and then the um, insurance companies will cover it. Now, I, I will say that another complicating factor is that all my training has been to how to make a drug into a medicine. I've not really been trained on how to commercialize a drug. Mm -hmm. And so unless you, if you get it approved and people don't use it, what have you really done? So we have hired- I don't think that's gonna be a great problem, but <laughs> that's also my opinion. I, I, I feel like the word of mouth on this one's going to be pretty good. I, I think because so many, well, people respond to stories. And when we have so many stories of people being healed, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I think the um, chances are that it, it will be um, adopted. But what we are um, wanting to do to chart a path, we're working with this group called the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative. And there are a lot of people from tech and from other groups, other funders. And so this group is sort of helping them um, figure out with their philanthropic dollars where, where to put them in psychedelics. And so what, we're, what they've done uh, with us is we've hired the Boston Consulting Group to chart out the path to commercialization. And it turns out um, that David Bronner, who's mm -hmm. you know, on our board of directors, um, he went to Harvard, his um, close friend, um, Dan Grossman is a senior partner at BCG right now. And Dan is actually the one that gave David Bronner his first hit of LSD. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so we went to, to Dan Grossman uh, and David did, and, and he's, he was very thrilled to, to work on a psychedelic project. Mm -hmm. He specializes in pharma. He got some of their great team and he said that it was a $2 million value that they're gonna give us for uh, three quarters of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So we have this very interesting um, BCG report on the track to commercialization. And so this has led us to the challenge that we're in now, which is what they're suggesting is that if we were a normal pharmaceutical company, and which we're not, of course, but if we were, and we recognize that we've got this six year limited period of data exclusivity for PTSD. Yep. What we wanna do is hit the ground running with as many therapists trained as possible, with all of our team, with all of our negotiations with insurance companies as much as we can ahead of time, with all of our government relations, with we have to actually reschedule um, in every single state. So if MDMA becomes a medicine, it's in schedule one right now. Um, the DEA, because they're not so thrilled always by making drugs that are scheduled into medicines, um, they've been slow in this process in the past. So Congress passed a law a bunch of years ago, DEA must reschedule within 90 days. 
But then the states have to reschedule as well. So here in Texas, and there's 25 states where it's automatic or automatic unless something happens. Mm -hmm. So in Texas, um, I think as commissioner of public health or um, it's automatic unless the commissioner objects. And so um, we've had um, an incredible situation here in Texas, which was, um, you know, a bill has been passed that actually provides state support for psilocybin for PTSD. Governor Rick Perry was one of the lobbyists for this mm -hmm. because he's now come on board for the importance of psychedelics. And what it also provides is that the Commissioner of Public Health, they have to go ahead and um, do a survey of the literature on MDMA. So sort of prepare ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, California, you have to have a special law signed by the governor to reschedule a drug. So we're working with various other groups. There's a, a psychedelic decrim law in California now that's been through the uh, Senate, the state Senate. It's being considered by the assembly. It's for decriminalizing psychedelics throughout in the whole state. But it also has this clause that if it does pass, that they will automatically reschedule when FDA and DEA do. So, so we have to do all this work in the different states. And what BCG is suggesting is that- My Texas pride flared up a little bit right there. I, I don't mean, know if you could see it. Probably I, the I, camera was <laughs> off me, but it came through a little bit. I could feel my shoes turn into boots real quick and I got, yeah. got excited. Well, Texas is, is pretty incredible what's happening. And, and so, um, which I'll get to in a minute, because I'm here because of a um, meeting with uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw that mm -hmm. just happened in Houston. So, but I'll just finish with the BCG and get to yep. that. But so what they've suggested is that we need to spend between 70 and $80 million beforehand, starting now to build a team of 60 or 70 people. Well, there's one, piece, there's one piece that I haven't, <clears throat> that I don't think has been sufficiently explained. Uh, you're, so all of this makes sense if you're trying to maximize the revenue during the six year window and get the highest proliferation, which has a huge value to the human health of our world. So it's not yeah. just money, but there, is there another section of MAPS that is not nonprofit that is actually going to be able to reap the benefit of this? Yes, yes, uh, yes. And that's called the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. Yep. So once I learned about this um, data exclusivity in December of 2014, we created the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. And what we wanna do, we're innovating in terms of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but we also wanna innovate in terms of how to market a pharmaceutical. And we don't want to be a profit maximizing marketer. I think that the profit motive in healthcare has made it so that in America, we have the highest per capita expenditures per person, but our outcomes on average in countries are down like 50. Sure. Because so much money is being siphoned off by insurance companies, by whether you get care or not. So what we wanted to do is demonstrate a new way where you maximize public benefit, not profit. So it is a for-profit company, but it's not a traditional for-profit company. And our structure is that the Public Benefit Corporation of MAPS is 100% owned by the nonprofit. So we have a pharma company, psychedelic pharma company owned by a nonprofit drug legalization, harm reduction, um, policy and advocacy group. And what we're planning to do, where is this line between public benefit and profit? Where you can set it in any number of places. So one of the challenges that we have is where do we set the price of the MDMA? Mm -hmm. And then what do we do with the resources? So what BCG is suggesting is at a price that, um, what they said is that f you look at the um, value to offset medical care that if you, you help somebody deal with their problems and then they don't need a lot of more treatment, you've helped them. Then you also look at the benefit to society. Now they can go back to work, now they can do a lot. Of, and then you look at the benefits to their families. And, and so, so you end up with a million dollar dose of MDMA <laughs> using those criteria because well, it's enormous. Well, yes, what, what BCG actually suggested is that a pharma company that was profit maximizing would probably come in somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to $20,000 a dose. And that's three MDMA sessions. So what they suggested to us is that we consider between one and 6,000. Mm -hmm. My guess is that, um, we, we don't know where we're gonna end up, 
on this. The, the other, there's so many complications, but the other issue is what is the real cost to the patients? So that's the co-pays right. for those that are insured. So if we get insurance, you can have higher prices for the drug, but you can cap people's co-pays by the number of visits, different things, so that people could pay five, $600, but the pharma companies could pay all this money for the drug and the, the therapy. So what, they're, what that does do is, what about the one third of people that don't have insurance? You know, the self-pay people. So if you've got this really high price, they're having to pay the whole thing. They're not having just to pay the copays. Now, some of them can afford it and some of them cannot. And some of them will not be able to afford it because of your high price and you will lose them. And you, they won't get the healing. So what we're gonna try to do is have a, what's called a very robust patient assistance program. And so we will provide the drug for free for uh, people that can't otherwise afford it. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the treatment is drug plus therapy. And so we can provide the drug for free to people, but unless there's some way for them to pay for the therapy, they're not gonna get sure. the treatment. So what BCG is saying is that there's ethically, there are a lot of trade-offs. There's no easy answer, but if you charge a higher price and you make a bunch more money, then you're able to actually subsidize the therapy as well as the drug for people yep. that can't afford it. The other part of this to add further complexity is what are we really trying to do? We are really, our goal is mass mental health. You know, we really need to get, and, and that's why on the one hand, we're working to work on drug development through the FDA. On the other hand, we're working through drug policy reform and legalization for people that, to be able to buy these drugs on their own. And you should be able to buy MDMA for 10 bucks or something like that. And you should be able to use it if you have PTSD, if you wanna to try to heal yourself, or if you want your friends to sit with you. Sure. We would promote that. And so we're not like, again, a normal pharma company where we see drug policy reform and legal access as a threat to our business model. We see it as an aid to our real mission, which is mass mental health. And we also see it as, this is my difference than I think a lot of the for-profit companies is that I, I tend to think that if it's legal and it's easy for people to get, and we've trained them in harm reduction and we've made our public, our treatment approach, all of that, that there's gonna be even more people that are wanna go for treatment by trained professionals in psychedelic clinics covered by insurance. So I think legalization is actually good for our business model. Mm -hmm. Most other companies, they either don't want to get into the controversy or they um, think it's bad for their business model. But in any case, that's, that's a big part of what we're doing. But the other part is, what does mass mental health really mean? For me, it means global. And, and what you're talking about, seeing the earth from space or mm -hmm. things like that, to get this global perspective, that's really, in a way, what got me into psychedelics in the first place, mm -hmm. is the political implications of a... Um, unit of mystical experience. You know, that if you're part of everything, how can you kill somebody because they're a different religion? Or how can you be racist? Or how can you destroy the environment because it's not really you, you're throwing it out. So mm -hmm. um, that's what, what got me in when I was 18 years old, to this the idea of crazy world, we're destroying ourselves. Can we help people realize that they're part of a bigger system and stop fighting each other in these ways? But what I mean by mass mental health now is, what if we have a price that, makes it, and this is one of the things that BCG has presented to us, that there's a certain price that they think maximizes, um, well, they think we get way more money by limiting the number of people that can get it, monopoly pricing. But but there's one price that they suggested that would cut down the demand by 30%. And they say you can make up 10% of that by these patient assistant programs. These are all models though. These are all models, but, but the part of it is then, what do we do with the money? Let's say we do make this more money, but 20% of Americans who would get treated don't get treated. But what if we go down to South Africa or Somaliland sure. or, and, and treat people at a fraction of the cost and, and treat more people? So ethically, it's not clear what's the public benefit, how do we define the public? But I think what we're probably gonna do, and this is way premature, but I think we're gonna pick a price where we don't cut off 30% of the demand in the US. We can still give it away for free. We can, in, your, in South Africa, we can still do things like um, group therapy, which is what we're about to explore. So uh, I think we'll end up with a price that 
doesn't cut out a lot of Americans. But but anyway, that that's the, the some of the choices that we have to make. So yeah. we're also trying to globalize, and that's what I'm talking about now, but we want to go to Europe. So we need around 30, 35 million dollars to make MDMA into a medicine in Europe, which has got more people than the US. The reason it's so much less expensive in Europe than in the US is because they'll accept our US data. So we've already negotiated that. So it's like high leverage. It's leveraging our data to then go globalize. Mm -hmm. And then at least according to this BCG report, in the middle of 2024 is when we will hit a sustainability point meaning that the income from the sale of MDMA by prescription will cover our staff. So right now we have about 125 staff and two thirds are in the public benefit corp and one thirds are in MAP. People donate to MAPS, get a tax deduction. MAPS um, invests in the benefit corp and, that, and they do the research. The benefit corp will sell MDMA, it'll be taxable. Um, and then with the proceeds, um, we will then use it to further MAPS' mission So because there, there's no investors. So that's that's the big plan. So it will take us around $34 million, $30 or $40 million to reach this sustainability point in the middle of 2024. So what we've decided on at our board meeting at the end of June is to embark on a $150 million fundraising campaign, $50 million a year for three years, and we're looking at a whole series of options to do that. Our, our first option is philanthropy. Um, and that we've gotten this far with philanthropy, but in 35 years, we've raised $115 million to say now we want $150 million from philanthropy. That, you know, Paul Allen, at one point, the co founder of Microsoft, gave $25 million to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And I'm like, okay, that's great, but what about <laughs> where's intelligence on Earth? I mean, could you, yeah. <laughs> you know, give twenty five million dollars? Maybe we can find some emotional and spiritual intelligence on Earth. So we're hoping that 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 we will raise this with philanthropy. We're also looking at a series of um, philanthropic uh, debt, we're calling it, or loans, where it'll be capped returns, and we'll pay people out of the proceeds of uh, selling MDMA, but they have to be willing to lose the money because. What if we don't succeed? We have no collateral. We have no assets other than this drug development sure. effort. The other form is partnerships with different for-profit companies because we've built this incredible team of experts in psychedelic psychotherapy research. And we have research sites and we know how to do it to meet the regulatory requirements. And so a lot of these for-profit companies have set up on the basis of ideas. So to give you an example, in the last two years, MAPS has raised about $45 million. The for-profit psychedelic companies have raised over a billion dollars from the capital markets on stories, and many of them, their no, none of their none of them are as evolved into phase three. None of them are even into phase three, and they also tend to contract out to what are called CROs, contract research organizations, to do their research for them, which is very expensive. I think a key to our success has been we've built internally our own research yeah. team. So we may we have a bunch of offers from different companies that are interested in partnering with us. And so we're exploring that. And then the fourth thing we're looking at is IPO. So as I said- For we, the Public Benefit for Corp. For the Public Benefit Corp. We, we've built um, over a billion dollars of public value compared to these other market caps of the other. So we could raise two, $300 million if we think in the IPO. But what are the pressures of investors? And, and even in a public benefit corp where you maximize public benefit over profit, the line is not that settled in law where you set that line. So we could still have investors that say, hey, we don't like the fact that you're um, giving it all free to South Africa. You should at least charge 10 bucks or whatever. They might say, you're not, okay, we buy into, we've bought into the public benefit, but you're, you're too much on the public benefit side and not enough on the for-profit mm. side. So we're, we're nervous, I would say, about, and you could get aligned investors and, and things like that to vindicate it. Any case, we're looking at all these four different approaches. You could also do, instead of an IPO, you could do private investment into the public benefit corp where, where you can yeah. really select yeah. the investors and it's not open to the public markets where some hungry profit-driven yeah. VC or something could just buy up a bunch of shares and start to assert leverage, you know, so that's, I guess, the fifth option. Yeah, yeah. And so, we, thank you for that, because mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk about that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we do want to explore options because we need the first fifty million before the end of this year, before the end of twenty twenty one. And 
So this is our plan. And, and what we're able to tell donors, what, why, why this public benefit corp in a way was set up is that there are so many different uses of MDMA that we would exhaust philanthropy to go one after another after another, but we're in the rare position of actually having a product. We're a nonprofit with a product that has uh, good markups and yet can still treat. So our goal is really in the first, um, in the period of data exclusivity to um, have a million MDMA sessions. And so we're, we're thinking about primarily the number one thing is the number of people treated. The, the amount of money is secondary. The number of people treated is first. We think we'll have roughly half a million people treated each getting on average two sessions. Some will get three, some will get one, different amount. So that, that is really our metric that we're looking at is a million people treated during in the US alone, not in these other countries. And to do that, we're gonna need to train about 25,000 therapists. And so far we have just a couple hundred therapists fully trained. We have about uh, 2,000 that are partially trained. And what I mean by that is that the next steps of the training are that we, we have a protocol where we can, therapists can volunteer to take MDMA themselves under supervision. And so they understand to be a patient, what it's like to be sure. a patient. And Seems many of these important. therapists, as we scale, have never done MDMA before. Or some of them have done MDMA as ecstasy back when they were in college, but they say it's so totally different when they take it internally. Of course. Looked at. And so we are now scaling up our therapy training program. We are trying to scale up all of these um, commercialization people that we need. Um, we're scaling up in, in Europe. So it's a very difficult time. And, and, and here's I mean, why, here's why I think it's not that difficult. Here's okay, why. Okay. And, and I think that it's com it's complex, but the reason why it's not difficult or it's not stressful for me is because I know your heart and I know the, or and I know the heart of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately like whatever decision you guys make is going to be the best decision that possibly can be made, mm -hmm. right? Like a decision is going to be made and ultimately that decision is going to be the best decision that you have with your heart fully online and your heart fully on board with the decision. And so while it's complex, I think it's also in some ways simple. It's like work all the data and make the best decision. But the beauty of this is that, you know, I know I've known you for a long time. Yeah, I've met yeah. a lot of the different people in the organization. Yeah. It's a heart-led organization. Yeah, and nice what, whatever, you, whatever is decided is going to be decided for the right reason. And I can't help but think that all of the seen and unseen assistance that comes to those who dedicate yeah. themselves yeah. to a path with heart is going to come to fruition. And I, and I think this is all, while it's complex, yeah. it's gonna yeah. all fall into place. Wow. You know, and it just yeah. really will. And I know that, you know, just... I don't know. I would say that my message to you and all the maps is you can't do it wrong. <laughs> like you can't do it wrong. Whatever way you do, wow. it's the best decision you could make. And in many ways, like the the divine intelligence behind that mm -hmm. decision will reveal itself when it's revealed, you know? I think, thank you for that. There's a lot of that. Yeah. And and I would add that the, um, the main learning I got from my Ibogaine experience, which was one time in 1985, and I think it's been a lot of um, MAPS's success has been to separate out um, self-criticism from self-hatred mm. and to be able to learn from mistakes. Sure. And so, you know, if you're a kind of a perfectionist, everything that is a mistake is like super painful. And, and that's also like you're not wanting to be human. You're wanting to be some perfect thing. But what I have what I would add to your thing that every decision we make will be the right one is that we will... Um, learn from all the decisions that we make that's right and we will constantly that's try. why they're the right decisions <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Uh, that was a thing that needed to be learned yes if you make a decision that ultimately steers in a direction it's a, just a learning it's just a way to learn it's yeah. because the motivation yeah. i think the only wrong decisions are decisions made when you know better but you're doing something else because you're greedy or you're doing something else mm -hmm. because you have some other motivation you're trying to impress somebody or trying to mm -hmm. that's when it's that's when i could think all right that was a wrong decision i knew better Mm -hmm. but I did the other thing intentionally. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. usually pretty rare. Most of the time yeah, we're really yeah. doing our best. Yeah. You know, and there's no doubt that you guys are going to do your best. I'm sure you'll learn. I'm sure, you know, maybe prices will adjust and things yeah. will, you'll figure yeah. stuff out along yeah. the way. But yeah. 
I just have this immense faith, the longer I've gone in my own path, I have this immense faith in the intelligence and the assistance of humanity and the world. Like I think, I think the world really wants this. It really, really wants this. This is healing the heart. Like if you think of the heart of the planet, we are the planet. And this is healing the heart of the planet as us, as the, the kind of the stewards and also the ones that could either be stewards or destroyers. Like we as representative of earth have to heal our heart to heal the earth. It's essential. It has to go that way first. If we just heal the earth, put all of this money into all these environmental things, but our hearts aren't healed, we're just going to destroy the earth again. Yes, exactly. Well, it'll never it'll never change. Like this is the fountainhead. This is like this is the point upstream that we need to address before anything downstream is ever going to be cleaned up. So anybody listening like I I love all of the initiatives that are out there for, you know, agricultural reform and biodiversity of soil and all of the different things. It's all super important, very much so. But the most important thing and I've always maintained this, like the most important thing is the healing of the human mind and the human heart. And I don't know anything on planet Earth that does that better than these medicines, particularly this MDMA-assisted psychotherapy session. I mean, yeah. what, so for me speaking as me now, you know, mm. I've been blessed to be in the room in some of these underground treatments, you know? And I've seen it. I've mm. seen things happen there. And I've been in all the ayahuasca sessions. I've been in, countless mushroom and dmt sessions and bufo ceremonies and all the i have never seen healing as profound as when there's two a male and female therapist yeah. taking somebody in the blindfold with the music through an mdma assisted psychotherapy process i've never seen anything close to it and that's i mean iboga can be pretty fucking profound too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like i think those out of all of the things those are the two that and everything is profound and beautiful and i'm a yeah, huge advocate yeah. of all of the medicines but it's un it's unimaginably profound what what even and these are people some have classic ptsd some have just garden variety trauma that we all carry everybody has a num yeah. has a has a number on that trauma scale you know like very few yeah. people are coming in with a goose egg of trauma yeah. like we all have shit we carry but no matter what it is every time i've seen it i've seen it really change people's lives in a fundamental way and that could be someone who's gone to burning man for five years and mm -hmm. taken plenty of mdma mm -hmm. out on the playa had good experiences mm -hmm. but there's something different when you take the you know when the blindfolds off and you're looking at fire and fireworks and music yeah. and you're dancing and there's people it's a lot of external you know input and, and stimulation but when you have the blindfold on all of that inner vision goes right into your heart and right into your psyche and it's just it's absolutely unbelievable what uh, what this treatment has to offer. And it's such a subtle shift from normal processing with MDMA so that it's easier to integrate as well. Yep. So it's easier to take the lessons from MDMA and build it into your life. Yeah, because it's not coming to you as a vision of a man with a crocodile head speaking to you <laughs> in mystical, you know, like riddles, you know, they're like, what does that even mean? You know, it's like you talking to you like, oh man Whew. like really just sitting with the truth that yeah. you're creating that your truth like your truth that's you know often just right behind the veil of accessibility yeah and and on the theme of the world wanting this um that is what um brought me here so to houston in the last few days on friday um a friend of mine, um, Sri Kulkarni, um, was from the State Department many years, expert in national security. He, he left the State Department um, to run for office, and he ran for office in Houston in 2018. He got like 44% of the vote, um, or 46, something like that. He ran for office again in 2020, uh, didn't win, but he's about the most progressive person, extremely progressive. Um, and he uh, ran his campaign. Uh, Houston is uh, a majority minority, and he ran his campaign in, in multiple different languages. Uh, he's very, you could say, left-wing progressive Democrat. He introduced me to Dan Crenshaw, who is also 
from Houston, a member of Congress, but is a former Navy SEAL, is a very staunch Republican. And, and I think this is one of the best parts of America and, and maybe one of the best parts of Texas mm -hmm. is that um, although you know you see the fights between the Texan Republicans and Democrats right now, but this progressive person introduced me to somebody on the other side of the political spectrum who cared about PTSD. And what's happened is that Dan Crenshaw has heard from a lot of Navy SEALs who have had PTSD or traumatic brain injury and have gone to the VA and have not gotten the treatments that they needed and have then gone down to Mexico for Ibogaine and 5-methoxy-DMT, or some of them have gone down to um, South America for ayahuasca, or some of them have done underground MDMA treatments, and he's also spoken with people that were veterans that were in our study and has heard about the healings that they've received. So now um, Dan Crenshaw is one of our strongest allies for psychedelic research, particularly MDMA research for PTSD. And he's partnering with Tim Ryan, who's a member of Congress from Ohio, who's one of the more um, progressive Democrats. And we're trying to work with them on uh, two different bills for Congress. One would give 25 million to the Department of Defense for psychedelic research for PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And the other would give uh, 25 million to the VA. Now, we don't know if these bills will succeed, but we again have this bipartisan support. And so, what uh, Dan does every year, this was his third annual Healthcare Innovation Summit. And he invited me to be one of the people that he interviews. So he interviews like four people from different healthcare innovative companies. And he'll have several hundred people there and it'll be broadcast and stuff. And so Dan invited me to be in this event on Friday. And it was tremendous. The, the first speaker was the former uh, commissioner of the FDA who just left a few months ago, so was involved with uh, development of the vaccines, and, and he won this Crenshaw Award. Uh, Dan gives his mother died of cancer, I think, when he was around 10 years old. And so he's always been very interested in healthcare and promoting innovation. And So this event, on the one hand, I'm like surrounded by Texas Republicans, you know, and I know about the Texas Democrats, at least from the House, leaving the uh, state, um, but it was a warm and friendly, it, it went great. It mm -hmm. was really went great. And, and I think in part, there was a veteran who had been in our study, John Lubecki, who spoke along with me about his personal testimonial. And th there was one sweet moment too, that, that I, when I started my talk, um, I just wanted to say, look, that we're here because of philanthropy and we're here because we've created bipartisan support. We've been able to take this out of, um, the political sphere in a way. And I said, we've received funds from Rebecca Mercer, who we know family um, owned Cambridge Analytica and Breitbart and big Trump and Bannon supporters. Um, Elizabeth Koch, who herself is uh, not conservative, but from the Koch family, Charles Koch is, you know, she's apolitical a or, or so. Um, her father is Charles Koch. Um, we've gotten funds from the Rockefellers, the Buffets, the Pritzkers. Um, and, and as I was describing this, I was sort of, and, I, and I said, and we've gone all the way to George Soros. And so there was this neat kind of mo moment where Dan tried to make a joke of like, oh, George Soros. But he kind of, it was like, it's still okay. You know, that, that he's in a partnership in a way that this mission is not just Rebecca Mercer, it's, yeah. it's George Soros. And, and it's so, almost like it's bringing the higher parts of all humanity forward. Yeah, it felt like that. And, and, and then there was this one um, woman who's running for Congress and she's a therapist and she used to work at the Houston VA. And she was very sympathetic. Her husband is a vet and she talked about PTSD and EMDR and um, it, it was just a delightful conversation. And then she said that she was um, actually running against a Republican. And I'm like, oh, okay, that, that was that, okay. I wonder if you've got a chance of getting elected or not. And it was just great. We exchanged cards. I go home and I'm writing her a, a sort of thank you note and just to say, keep in touch. Turns out she's running as a Republican against a Republican and she's farther the, to the right than the Republican that's hmm. in. And yet... We had a delightful conversation. So what's coming out of this is that the state of um, 
Texas is going to be funding a psilocybin PTSD study. And it's probably, it, it, it's at Baylor Medical and uh, potentially connected to the Houston VA. And the woman, uh, Lynette Averill, who was uh, the researcher there, is the, uh, has a good chance of getting this funding. What she's talked about is a um, separate arm that we would fund through philanthropy that would do MDMA for PTSD. And then we would compare psilocybin versus MDMA. That's great. Yeah, and then the other part of, and this gets back to um, the state of Michigan now, I'll just say that we have, in addition, I've just talked about MDMA and mostly for PTSD, but we're trying to become um, experts in PTSD. And there's a lot of people that may not wanna do the hard work of the therapy, it, it is painful. And so cannabis has been used by a lot of veterans and others for PTSD. It helps them not have the nightmares, it focuses them more on the present. And so we've completed the first study ever, controlled study of cannabis for PTSD. And we got a $2.2 million grant from the state of Colorado from their marijuana taxes. And it took us seven years to get permission to do this study. Um, even after we had FDA permission, the National Institute on Drug Abuse that until recently had a monopoly on the supply of federally legal marijuana, they didn't wanna sell us the marijuana. Eventually, we got approval. It took us three years to do the study, and we were comparing four different groups of uh, 76 veterans, um, 19 in each group, and one group got marijuana with THC. Um, we wanted high THC. The highest THC night ahead was 12%. We tested it twice. It was 9%. Um, another group had 12% CBD. Another group had... It was supposed to be 12% THC, 12% CBD, but the best they could do was 8% THC, 8% CBD. And then the other group there's is- There's a lot of like, there's a lot of weed cultivators out there right now like, oh man, I could have given you that 15% easy. <laughs> That's totally right, Harvey. That is, People are like, come on, man. Yeah. I, got, I got you, Rick. <laughs> but it, yes, but we were limited. Well, we since 1968, this monopoly, this federal monopoly at the University of Mississippi growing under contract to the government has been in existence. We've tried since 2000 to end the monopoly and actually it just ended a couple months ago. Nice. Where they gave four licenses. But the fourth group had um, alcohol washed cannabis. So what it does is it takes out all the terpenes and all the cannabinoids. So you still have, you still smoke something, but it's really got no active ingredients in it. So those were the four groups. Mm -hmm. And what we did was, um, worked through the study and, and there was this one guy that was very interested in um, becoming a public spokesperson to say what happened to him because he was able to get over his PTSD. He felt that this was tremendous, that this cannabis worked great. And even more importantly, he said he was on opiates for pain and he was able to um, stop using the opiates and substitute the cannabis for the opiates. And he was a veteran and, and he, he got a lot of um, media attention and, and it was a great story that he told. And at the end of the study, when we uncovered the blind, it turned out he was in the placebo group. It was just a shocker to him, a oh, shocker wow. to all of us. It shows the power of the mind. If you think you're getting healing, you can do incredible work on your own without active ingredients. Yeah, That's what we showed in a way in the MDMA study where 30 Two percent of the people that got therapy without MDMA, they knew they pretty much knew they didn't have MDMA. But the, but this placebo effect in the cannabis really shocked us, mm -hmm. and so all the four groups got better, but the group that got the least amount of the benefit was the group that had CBD. And we think about CBD so much as anti-anxiety, anti-pain. They showed the least benefit. The next group was uh, the THC CBD combination. Then the, the group that got the second most benefit was the placebo group. And the group that got the most benefit had THC, but they weren't that much more beneficial than the placebo. So what we showed is safety. We demonstrated safety. Nobody hurt themselves. This was nobody had any kind of problems that we could tell on safety, but we failed in terms of efficacy. So we're gonna redo this study with money from the state of Michigan. So friends of ours at the Marijuana Policy Project uh, particularly um, Rob Campia, who lives here in Austin. Was it was it close? I mean, was it indicated, was it trending positive? Is that well, why you want to do it Well, it all trended positive, but the THC was a bit more than the mm -hmm. placebo, but not that much more. 
So the the state of Michigan, when they legalize marijuana, um, the initiative language says they have to spend $20 million a year for two years to fund research in veterans for veterans' health and reducing veteran suicides. And it's only for FDA-approved studies, and it's only to nonprofit organizations or to academic researchers. So we've just submitted a $17.5 million grant to do a large number of veterans. And we'll have one site at the Tampa Veterans Administration, one site in Phoenix, Arizona with Sue Sisley, which will be unaffiliated with the VA there, and um, two sites in Michigan, one affiliated with a VA and one not. And then we've um, said that there'll be two more sites that we'll add. We're not sure where they are. But what we're hoping, potentially, if we get the grant, is that one of these sites would be in, at the Houston VA as well, that this would be a Texas study. And it will take a couple of years, and then we'll see. And the one thing we're going to do, well, two things we're going to do differently than the first study. The first thing is we're going to use better marijuana. <laughs> 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 Number yep. one, better marijuana. And of the people that just got the licenses to grow domestically from the DEA, none of them are going to have the marijuana developed enough and standardized enough in time for this experiment. So we're gonna import either from Israel, Canada, or Australia. And so we're, we're talking with different companies in those countries. Um, so far, nobody has been able to import flour yet um, for research. So this is gonna be flour, smoked. Um, we'll let people have vape, vaporizers, but they can use vaporizers or, or smoke, whichever they want. It'll take us a couple of years to do the study. And we think that cannabis is more about symptom reduction than it is about cure. Sure. But that's enough for a lot of people. And also in the future, as we think about things, we ask people to withdraw from all of their psychiatric medications to be in the MDMA study. So if they're on SSRIs or any kind of drugs, they ha that mutes the effect of MDMA. They have to withdraw. And that can take months sometimes. It's five half-lives plus a week. But if they were to substitute cannabis instead of these SSRIs, um, it can help with a lot of the symptoms, but you only need to stop smoking the day before you get MDMA. It's not gonna have this lingering sure. effect the way SSRIs do. So I could imagine in the future, um, a fair number of people who are reluctant to taper off their medicines, even though they still have major PTSD, they're still worried about being st stabilized, that maybe one day we'll be able to bring them um, cannabis to use, and then we'll switch to the MDMA to get the heart of the problem. And then at the end, um, they won't need more MDMA, and if they want to smoke pot, they'll do it for something other than PTSD. Yeah. So that, that's in a way the long-term vision. And so we'll see about this cannabis project, and we're very much hoping that one of the sites uh, can potentially be in Texas. We'll, we'll see. We don't know if we're gonna get the grant. We'll find out in a couple of weeks, a little early indications. Um, but we're hopeful. And, and so I think this meeting with Dan Crenshaw was just so good to really build these. Uh, people can be aligned on treating suffering. Of course. And we can do that without getting trapped into partisan situations. And th there was, uh, to give an example of, of, of why I think this is so important, um, I was at a Passover dinner and this was a couple years ago, and um, it was a bunch of scientists. And I was sitting next to this uh, older couple who I didn't know. My wife and I were sitting next to this older couple who I didn't know. And um, I, I said to the guy, are you a um, scientist? He said, no, I'm a judge. Well, okay, he's a judge. And then his wife started sharing that she's um, writing a book about grief, about parents who've lost a child, and how you cope with the grief of that, because that's among the most painful emotional things could happen to you. A lot of relationships break up. And so I was saying that's like PTSD. And we had this long conversation about uh, MDMA therapy and MAPS and what we're doing and marijuana and the government monopoly and all this kind of stuff. It was a tremendous conversation, but something finally clicked in my head. And I realized that this guy wasn't just a judge. He was a Supreme Court judge. Oh, wow. He was a U.S. Supreme Court judge. And so... I was like, oh my God. So I said, um, can I ask you an ethical question? And he said, sure. So I said, here's my ethical question. I've taken a million dollars in donations from Rebecca Mercer. And 
almost, you know, most of the people that support maps are more progressive. And of all the things I've done in the, um, at this point, it was only 33 years, but I said, of all the things I've done in the 33 years of maps, the thing I've got the most criticism for is taking money from Rebecca Mercer. People are demonizing her and they say it makes her look good and I shouldn't have done any of that. But I said, I think it was one of the best things I ever did because we need bipartisan support. And, and so I just wonder ethically, you know, was she quote a toxic donor or, or what, what do you think I should have done? And what he said was so, so relieving. He said, um, the essence of democracy is finding common ground with people with whom you may disagree on every other issue. And he said, in this hyperpartisan era that we're in, there's not enough of this finding common ground. So he said, I think you did exactly the right thing. I would echo that for sure. Yeah, and, and it felt right to me. That is so right, and that's what we need to do. And so to not do it seems so so wrong. No, no, we don't want this million dollars that's going to help revolutionize mental health and and ease the suffering and saves countless lives because it's coming from you. Like what the fuck? Yeah, and and I think there's also this way where we think in simple ways. Like people are all good or all bad or this is black and white. So Rebecca Mercer, she's done things I don't agree with, but she's done things that are good too. I mean, I wanna give her opportunity to do something that we all agree with. So yeah, I, I really felt that that was yeah. the right thing. And so I think this meeting with Dan Crenshaw was sort of in that spirit. And that that's what got me to to Houston and to here and well there's um, a lot of a lot of good news that have been coming out of this podcast <laughs> I'm, I'm really pleased this has obviously been something I've been passionately tracking for a long time as we kind of wrap up this here oh you got well, another well, thing? Yeah. there are a few more things that I want yeah, to share yeah, just on, on this theme of good news so um and also on this theme of trying to um reach out to people who um, what Elizabeth Koch has has these events that she calls unlikely collaborators so for me, one of the most unlikely collaborators are the police. You know, I've always thought of the police as uh, they're the predator and I'm the prey <laughs> <laughs> because of my drug use, not because I'm a big criminal, but <laughs> understandable. But they're the predator and I'm yeah. the prey, and and so it's been hard for me to. No one celebrates the cop walking around Burning Man. I'm just saying. You're like, yeah. oh shit, that's a cop for real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so. Um, Actually, there was one time years ago where I um, spoke to um, this woman, Valerie Mojeko, who is deputy director of MAPS, and she was at the MAPS office uh, in California. And um, I was calling her, and she said that there was police all over the place and that there was um, a murder down the road and a pregnant woman had been killed. And I just thought, what would it be like to be the police officer, to have to see this pregnant woman murdered and, and I had this sympathy in a way for this police. And then coincidentally, later that day, I get a call from somebody from Vancouver. It, it's, um, and what he said is that he's a therapist and he's interested in Ibogaine and that we had been um, involved with Ibogaine research. We were trying to start some stuff in uh, Vancouver and he wanted to know, you know how we were doing some Ibogaine stuff. And then he said, well, I really need to tell you I'm a police officer, I'm a, you know, therapist for the police officers. And and I was like, do you have police with PTSD? And he said, yeah, we do. I said, well, let's work with them. Let, so, yeah, of course. so I was opened up through this series of coincidences. So years later, what I felt is we ne- really need to build the uh, relationship with the police. And so there's a senior retired DEA official, Tony Colson, who is now a consultant for us. And the reason is in part, what started this was, that his son went to Iraq, has PTSD, and uses cannabis to help him with his PTSD. And it changed the mind of the father. So uh, Tony arranged for us to give a presentation at the International Association of Chiefs of Police. So it's like 10,000 police chiefs and their senior staffs from all over the world. This was in Orlando. And um, going through the... um, the marketplace, the hall was like a terrifying thing because there's all these new straight jackets and new handcuffs and new batons and, uh, and new uh, technology to track people and new ways to spy on what they're saying through uh, these mechanisms to hear what somebody's saying a long distance away and all this kind of police technology. I'm like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but what what had happened ironically was that um, President Trump decided that this was his group, and so two days before the conference, he announced he was going to speak there, and they set his time exactly the same time as our talk. And like, damn, this is going to be bad. It's going to diminish the people that come to see us. So we get there, and it's uh, John Lubecki who is there. Um, Zenja Gelfand, who's one of our therapists, uh, Tony Colson and myself. And so we get to this uh, place. There's thousands and thousands of people in line to see President Trump. We get to our room, 350 people that it could have capacity, and there's only 20 people there. And we're like, well, okay, these are the 20 people that really want to be here. Sure. <laughs> they, they, and we gave our presentation, and afterwards a police officer came up to me, and he said, um, he was sitting in the front row, he said, I'm a full-time police officer, but I'm also a therapist, and I would like to go through your training program so I can give MDMA therapy to the police, because there's a lot of police that actually are committing suicide, Yeah, that it's not just veterans committing suicide. There's now an S estimated 17 uh, veterans a day. We, we hear 22, 20, but it seems like it's around 17 a day as the official numbers. It's probably an underestimate, but he said he wanted to um, go through our training program to help police. He also told me that veterans have preferential hiring at law enforcement. So you get people that are traumatized from being a veteran and then they come in a highly traumatizing group. So I said, we would love to have you. Uh, in our training program. Sarko Gregorian is his name. He's been through our early training program. He's from Massachusetts. He's introduced me to his police chief and several times. And we said, there's one more part of uh, the training program, which we'd like to talk about, which is that we give therapists an opportunity to volunteer to receive MDMA as a patient as part of their training. And so we'd like to give you that opportunity. And so Sarko was able to get permission from his police chief to do a federally legal study where he gets MDMA himself. Now, um, there is a, a book by Michael Pollan, How to Change Your Mind. Sure. And it's been incredibly- I, inter I interviewed him too. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's incredible. He's written a new one, just to say it's um, um, it's about plants, uh, mm -hmm. you know, about the changing your mind with plants. Um, and he looks at uh, opium, caffeine, and mescaline. Um, but Netflix is doing, a, or, or there's going to be a documentary about his um, book, and there's going to be one of the episodes is on MDMA. And so this police officer was filmed getting MDMA, and it may be a part of this documentary. That's beautiful. So Yeah, I can imagine a world where the the problem with the cops enforcing these things is that people we inherently know when we're afraid of the cops that if they come and mess with us, they're not doing it for our own good, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're enforcing laws that they have to enforce that don't really make any sense because we're just manipulating the sovereignty of our own consciousness. And this yeah. should be one of our inalien, fundamentally legal. Yeah, yes. should be fundamentally legal, like the ability to experiment and explore this in a safe container, obviously not driving a vehicle or doing something that would endanger someone else. So we get this kind of, idea like this is inherently unjust and so we protect we project that injustice upon the police when they're just doing their job it's the laws that are unjust right, exactly. they're the ones that are enforcing them so i've always imagined a world where the police didn't have unjust laws to enforce yes. and then then you would be stoked that the police were there because all they were there to do is prevent people from hurting each other which is yeah. great you'd be like yeah. oh sweet the cops are here amazing yeah. like i feel safer now of course you yeah, have there's they're human beings and they could be prejudiced they could be biased some are of course many many aren't of course and i think but but that environment where that's the reality i think we're approaching closer to that reality hopefully you know <clears throat> and it's got to be a tough time i have a lot of sympathy for the police as well because because of some of the actions of police officers probably all police have been in the worst you know cast in the worst light that they ever have you know, in, in history probably for a long time. And um, so I'm sure that's increasing the suicidality, just like yeah. the veterans that came back from Vietnam and the yeah. country hated them. And they're like, right. yeah. fuck, I'm just trying to do my best. Yeah. I yeah. thought I was serving my country in the best way. And now I'm being hated for it on top of this incredibly traumatizing experience that I was had. So I, I can imagine that this is a time where, yeah, I just see universal compassion as the as the universal solution right yes, like no yes. matter what whatever political party whatever agenda like whatever thing we're not going to heal with non-healing mindsets you know we're not going to heal with trying to cast someone out and judge them and and separate them like we want an inclusive world where we all come together well let's 
let's start that you know by like grabbing everybody and say come on like we're all in this together that's so right Ari. yeah and and to my um surprise my nephew has become a police officer so my sister's oldest is now a, a washington dc police officer and you know he's a reasonable guy he's doing it for the right reasons and he wants to be protecting people and mm -hmm. he is um luckily washington dc has um uh, legalized marijuana and decriminalized psychedelics and other drugs. Yep. Um, so, but but yeah, I'm now a police officer in my own family, mm -hmm. which is kind of amazing. The world is the world is changing rapidly, and it's it's a world that we can always point at the the difficulties of it, and whether it's the difficulties of overexertion of control that a lot of people are worried about, or division, or or environmental causes. There's a lot of things where you can, if you focus on it, there's a lot of trouble that's out there looking at it, but people are dramatically underestimating the impact that the legalization of these medicines is going to have. Like, it's yeah. like, just fucking can't, hang on. Middle of 2023, everybody, yeah. let's just keep it together yeah. for yeah. a little bit longer, everyone. Come on, yeah. we can do this. We could do this, and then we got some assistance. Yeah. All right, so let me chart way. out just a little bit of the future. Yeah. Okay, so 2023, we make MDMA into a medicine. Um, there's already about 300 ketamine clinics, several in in Austin, mm -hmm. throughout the United States. And a lot of the more enlightened providers are providing ketamine with therapy. There are still a bunch of people that just saying, here it's proved us as a physiological thing, we don't give it with therapy, but more and more the, the providers are providing it with therapy. I had Dr. Dave Rabin on the podcast, oh, oh, it was okay. phenomenal. Yes, yes, he's, uh, he talks about his wearable technology and things, mm -hmm. yeah. He's, I think he's gone through your uh, your protocol yes, for MDMA yes, assisted yes, psychotherapy yes, as well. Yeah. And he uses yeah. a lot of that same those same principles in his ketamine assisted psychotherapy. Yeah, because a lot of the people we've trained have wanted to put this into practice now, set up clinics. A lot of them are running ketamine clinics mm -hmm. and doing that. Um, so what we anticipate though, that the therapists really don't wanna be a ketamine therapist or an MDMA therapist or a psilocybin therapist. They wanna be a psychedelic therapist. Yeah, They, they wanna have a... Um, tool chest of all these different psychedelics that they can use. And we wanna cross train people in these. And so what we think is gonna happen is that um, once MDMA becomes approved, there's gonna be starting to be psychedelic clinics that are set up. They'll initially probably be MDMA and ketamine. A year or so later, they'll be psilocybin. And I think in the decade after approval, they'll end up being around 6,000 of these clinics in the United States. And the reason I say 6,000, is that we have around 6,000 hospice centers. So when you think about communities that are large enough to have a hospice center to help people have a more peaceful death, uh, you know, they can be large enough to have a psychedelic clinic. So mm -hmm. I'm just, and, and I think that we will in the end have hundreds of thousands of people working at these psychedelic clinics. And over time, the same way with what we've seen with medical marijuana has changed people's attitudes about marijuana and they've moved towards legalization that I think medical psychedelics over a decade or so, and people hearing all these stories, they'll end up um, realizing that it's not, this is a good drug or a bad drug or a party drug or a therapy drug, it's how it's used. And people will be able to be realizing that there is this fundamental human right to explore and that there's so many people that don't have a diagnosis that still can benefit for personal growth, for spirituality, for couples therapy. MDMA is great for couples therapy, but it's not a disease that the FDA would approve. So I think that what we'll have is these clinics will eventually, will start with patients and will then bring in family members. And we've already moved to that in a little direction. There's a study, there's a therapy for PTSD called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. And so conjoint is couples or dyads where one has PTSD, but it affects the relationship and they bring both people into the therapy. So in 2014, um, Richard Rockefeller, who um, was the son of David Rockefeller, but he was a doctor, he was chairman of the board of advisors of Doctors Without Borders, and he saw Kosovo and Serbia and so many people traumatized and he knew there was no, not enough therapists and patients, uh, therapists and psychiatrists, so he started contacting me about MDMA for therapy. And his cousin was Senator Jay Rockefeller and he was on the Senate, Ver Venice, Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. And they got us finally, after starting with 1990 to do work inside the VA, um, we got permission to work with this woman, Candace Monson, who developed cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. And so we did these uh, six dyads blending that with MDMA. So we're both of the 
a person with PTSD in the relationship got MDMA. And um, it was phenomenal. The results were better than anything with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy without MDMA, both for the person with PTSD, but both for the strength of the relationship for all the measures that they used. And so now we're trying to do a larger study with uh, cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy with and without MDMA to kind of demonstrate that. We want to incorporate that into the VA. So anyway, it starts with patients, then goes to their family members, then eventually I think these clinics will be able to take people who just want personal growth experiences for a range of different things. Yeah, sure. And then I think 2035, we hope that we'll have a uh, move to legalization and I'm calling it licensed legalization where it's a little bit different than the way it is now um, in that I think that um, we regulate alcohol too lightly. And what I mean by that is, let's say you are um, using alcohol and you get into a fight at, at a bar. Okay, you get into trouble for that, but the next day you can go into the bar and get more alcohol. Or you're a drunk driver, you, you get um, pulled over for driving under the influence, you lose your driver's license, you can still get alcohol, get in your car and kill people. So we should make it a little bit harder for people to get drugs that they've misbehaved on. Sure. So I think if you have a license, kind of like a credit card, and, and then it's easy to get, but it's easy to lose if you misbehave. And then it makes it a little bit harder. There'll always be a black market. But, but anyway, I think 2035, we moved to license legalization. And then I hope in the big picture by 2050, we have have enough people that are in this understanding of the way to use psychedelics for personal, emotional, and spiritual growth that we'll have a, enough of uh, humanity in that way that it'll kind of be more of a spiritualized humanity to kind of turn us more towards saving the planet from um, mass weapons and from climate change and from prejudice and stuff. So, so that's the big picture, the long-term plan. And um, as a, a final statement, I just want to say about the veterans is that since 1990, we have tried to start research inside the VA. And we were able to do this study with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy, but it was outside the VA. We had to pay for it. They wouldn't refer vets to us. And so we are now within weeks of having a study inside the Bronx VA with Rachel Yehuda, who's a top PTSD researcher. And she's also an expert in the epigenetics of trauma. And so what that means is that there's multi-generational trauma, that parents can pass trauma on to their kids. Sure. And, and she's identified, it doesn't change the genes, but it changes what turns on certain genes and certain genes that can be responsible for anxiety, depression. And it may be that therapy changes the epigenetic mechanism so that you can break the cycles of trauma. So she's now gotten about seven and a half million dollars of philanthropy, some from uh, Bob Parsons, who's a Vietnam vet, who's 70 years old, who's found healing in psychedelics. And uh, he was the founder of GoDaddy. And he does a lot of support for vets. Um, the Stephen and Alexandra Cohn Foundation uh, gave her $2.1 million for uh, MDMA research. So she's got around $7.5 million worth of philanthropy to do MDMA PTSD research inside the Bronx VA. We also have a study that's going to be starting also within a couple of weeks in the Loma Linda VA a small study just to train their therapist. That's funded by Bob Parsons. And then we're going to be doing a group therapy study. So this is to say that um, group therapy is one of the new areas that we really need to research is can we bring down the cost of the treatment through group therapy? Could groups support each other? Can it be more effective? I think we don't know. Maybe it'll be less effective where people aren't getting as much individual attention, but then they can get group support. So that is funded by the Stephen and Alexander Cohn Foundation, and that'll be at the um, Portland, Oregon VA. So we're now moving into the VA. The big next step for us is that um, active duty soldiers. We haven't treated a single active duty soldier. We have treated active duty police, mm. but we've not treated an active duty soldier. And we think that may also happen in the next couple months. We're working with a fellow, Bob Kaufman, at the, um, he's a psychiatrist, expert in PTSD at Walter Reed in, in DC, and they have access potentially to active duty soldiers. So th it, this is a time of incredible breakthroughs, things that have taken decades and decades to get us to this point. And so to start research inside the VA, if we can get active duty soldiers to finally start group therapy, I, I think just it's enormously promising where we're at and I'm looking forward to how we get this, uh, the resources that we need to sort of cr cross into what we're calling the bridge to sustainability. 
Yeah. And yeah, the bridge sure. to globalization and the bridge to commercialization. So that kind of brings it all around. For people listening who, and you know, as we wrap up here, for people listening who maybe it's themselves who have PTSD and they're listening to this podcast, maybe it's their uncle, their brother, their son, their, you know, somebody's listening and they know somebody, they're like, wow, I'd really like to get them, you know, in, enrolled in one of these programs. We get these questions all the time. What advice do you have for, you know, that person listening that has a family member that they would really love to have this experience? That's, thank, uh, yeah, well, because the, the key to our uh, timetables and everything is how quickly can we recruit people for our second phase three study? If we can recruit people faster, then the drug can be available faster to more people. Mm -hmm. So they would go to the MAPS website and under participate, there's a, if you wanna participate as a patient, you click on that. And then there's a series of questions that it asks you. One of them early on is gonna be your zip code. So that we have two sites in Israel, two in Canada and 11 throughout the United States. And we want people to be within an hour, an hour and a half drive of the site mm -hmm. because there's about 16 or 17 visits. Mm -hmm. Some of them will turn virtual, but but still there's a lot of visits. We want this to be um, not so stressful. It's already gonna be stressful for people to deal with this. So, mm -hmm. so if you live near one of these sites, um, this um, go through this program, it'll tell you and it'll then say who to contact at that site, the study coordinator. So you go to maps.org, you go to participate, you fill out these questions about um, who you are and what your issues are, and, and, and hopefully you'll live near one of these sites. Um, if not, I'd say the main messages for people is don't give up hope. That's the most important thing. So is hang that, on. Hang on, it's coming. Um, as I said about the Vietnam vet who was able to get help, um, no matter how long you're stuck, there's still the hope of healing. I, I should say it doesn't work for everybody. We, about um, 85 to 90% have either no PTSD or a clinically significant reduction of PTSD symptoms. So it doesn't work for everybody. It seems uh, to work for a vast majority of the people of the hardest cases. So yeah, don't give up hope. If you can't get into an MDMA study, you could try ketamine. Mm -hmm. That would be something that there's there's more ketamine clinics and accessibility. Um, people can learn about our treatment method. It's called the treatment manual. So you go to research, you go to on our you go to MDMA at the bottom of the page treatment manual that'll teach you about our therapeutic approach, which you can apply with, even without drugs is how to approach trauma. So I'd say, um, yeah, don't give up hope. It would be very sad for people to. Um, we're so close. We're so close. We're so close. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rick, for everything that you've been doing for so many years. And uh, it's because of your work and the work of a lot of other brave souls that I can genuinely look anybody in the eye and say that I have faith and I have hope for, for all of us because it's going to take, it's going to take a massive global healing. And, yeah. uh, and I believe that that's what's on the horizon. I think so. And I, and I also want to give a um, acknowledgement to your father because yeah. he was a early donor for MAPS and he was very supportive of the MDMA research and the Ibogaine research. And um, it was just was and such my a, own <laughs> personal research into this. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have gone on my first vision quest at, you know, when I was 18 years old and out in New Mexico, I wouldn't have had that first psychedelic experience that changed my life if my father didn't set it up. So, you know, even though he's, come on difficult difficult times of late like his impact on the world through me and through his supportive maps is will will go on forever so thank you for that yeah it's great Aubrey. thank you for this yeah. opportunity to educate people yeah absolutely for anybody listening maps.org if you want to donate you want to participate and thank you so much rick it's been a real pleasure thank great. you everybody goodbye Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.